This is the Mobile Tech Podcast, brought to you by worldpodcasts.com. Now here's your host, Tank Girl, Miriam Joie. Brought to you by Truecaller. Stay tuned for a special offer. Hi, and welcome to the Mobile Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Miriam Joie, and today is Tuesday, November 1st, 2022, and I have a couple of guests here from Truecaller. I have Clayton and Raphael. Hi, Clayton and Raphael. How are you guys? Hi, Mary. Hey, Miriam. Good to see you. Hard to believe it's already November 1st. <laughs> I know. I'm uh, kind of struggling with that myself. Obviously, you know that we're going to have a special guest later on the show to cover the news. But you all have experienced this problem where you get a phone call and it's spam or it's, you know, a bot or something. And, you know, some of us have tools for that. If you're on an iPhone, you can set that up. Your carrier probably has some tools to block some of these calls. And of course, Google's phone app is kind of the holy grail, in my opinion, right now. So that's what Truecaller provides. And I'm kind of curious to chat with both of you about what the pros and cons are of these different products and why people should potentially buy your app instead. So let's get started. Maybe tell us what the problem is and what you're trying to solve here. So I think uh, I'll go ahead and start, Raf. I think that you know the problem basically is that at a global level, uh, spam has been increasing almost exponentially every year. The amount of communications fraud, whether it's robocalls or robotexts. And to your point, Miriam, you know, some of the, the, the operating systems, Apple uh, and Android, have taken some steps to, to mitigate that problem. The carriers, particularly in the West, have taken some steps. I think in the case of Truecaller, it's all we do. Uh, we have over 320 million monthly active users. And between looking at the feedback we get from them and the activity we see across all of those devices, we have a real-time dynamic machine learning-based uh, approach to mitigating spam, at the same time, letting the important calls get through, which is where Raf and his team with their AI-powered assistant come in to, to make sure that you are processing the calls that matter to you. So is AI something that only Truecaller is using, or is your competition, like I presume Google would be using AI? So I, I would say, and I'll let Raf talk more about what he's built, and he and the team have built, but uh, you know, the Google, um, Google, of course, uses AI. I mean, that's their business. But you know, there's only so many Pixel phones. It's not. It's not a huge distribution of Pixel phones. Not a huge huge distribution of Google Voice. And keep in mind that what we're doing is not only using AI and ML to to dynamically score uh, the spammiest calls or, or make sure the good calls get through, um, but also using it to engage uh, with with Raf's assistant platform. So, Raf, tell us more. Yeah, so uh, the True Caller Assistant is uh, essentially uh, an AI assistant that uh, answers your phone calls for you. So you can and customize it however you like. You can have it answer uh, only uh, calls that are not in your contacts, so unknown mm -hmm. calls. And then the assistant, uh, that sounds uh, pretty real, uh, asks the caller who he is and wh why are they calling. And then um, you see the caller's answer on your phone um, as a message, and you can decide whether to answer, decline, mark as spam, or continue the conversation with the caller to get more information as chat. So let's say you're in a meeting or you're in an important um, uh, meeting with, with uh, uh, your school or your, in your business, and then you can't pick up the phone, but you want to know who it is. So that's what the assistant does. And I think that as a last line of defense, um, this is a very important tool. So the, the name of the, the feature like this is call screening. And mm -hmm. it's available also from other uh, companies, for example, yeah, I Google. Mean, yeah, exactly. That's the only one I'm familiar with, of course, because of Pixel user. But that's Pixel specific. I didn't realize you had call screening support, which is changes the game, I think that's obviously going to make a huge difference because not everybody has a pixel, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's the idea. Um, Google's call screening is only available on Pixel as a marketing feature to, to, for people to buy the, uh, the, the Pixel phone. And another point is that Google's call screening is a service that they provide 
and you get it and the way it's programmed that's how you can use it you cannot yeah. change it or or right or change the features or the voice or how it answers people if it's too much um if it's too um uh, official for example then i wouldn't want to use it because i don't want people to think i'm too but you can't change it so what we built is a call screening assistant that is 100% customizable. You can change the voice, how nice it is or how, how official it is. You can edit, edit groups of what it will answer to this group of contacts or a different group of contacts. And we're adding all sorts of customizations to make the assistant very uh, customized to you and your life and your usage and the type of calls you get. Um, and this makes it a um, very, very useful tool uh, for people uh, that get a lot of phone calls. So that's a lot more customizable than I thought. And I really did like what you mentioned earlier about the chat functionality, because call screening on Google let, doesn't let me continue in chat, right? And that's actually a pretty great feature now that you mention it. So is this an Android only thing? Because I'm trying to wrap my head around how you would turn this into a feature for iOS, since I don't believe you can replace the dialer in iOS, can you? That's true. So one of the most important uh, tasks that we had when we, when we started developing uh, the assistant um, was to make it available to all users and not only Android users. And I think making it available on iOS was one of the toughest challenges we faced, uh, but we made it work. And the way we made it work uh, will be, uh, it, it would be a, a bit technical. I'll try to simplify it. So the way it works is when you get phone calls uh, to your phone number, um, there is something called uh, call forwarding where you can just yep. forward all the all your calls to a different number. And usually people do that when they're when they travel or when they don't want to be reachable for a certain amount of time. Um, the, That's what um, Google uh, Voice actually how it works, right? Yeah. So I think my audience is very tech savvy. You don't have to worry. I think they understand how this works. I, th I exactly see where you're going now. Okay. And, and what we're using is an is a feature that not that is not uh, known by a lot of people. It's called conditional call forwarding, and that means ah. um, the calls that you get ring on your phone as usual. But if you don't answer, don't pick up or or hang up the call actively, um, then the call are the calls are forwarded. So we use this, and then the when you, if you don't answer. Or on Android, if you click on screen this call, or on iOS, if you just hang up the call, the call is mm -hmm. forwarded to our telephony servers. And then we have telephony servers um, that uh, handle the call. All the, all the uh, assistant feature and, and answering uh, happens on the telephony servers. Then the app gets the answer. You see the, the answer of the caller on right. your phone. And if you want to exactly. answer the call, for example, we reconnect the call again. Um, I see. Yeah. So you and call back my phone? Is that what you do? Yeah. If wow. if you see that it's an if you see that it's a call you want to answer, then you uh, then we reconnect the call. Do yeah. you actually do it via voice over IP at that point inside your app? Okay. So I was yeah. mistaken. I thought you were calling yeah. back my my cellular yeah. number. You're not. Okay. Yeah, we're very, doing very cool. Yeah. VoIP. And the funny thing is, sometimes VoIP is even with a higher uh, quality. Uh, than, of course, than regular of course. Voice, yeah. So yeah, so it's even a plus. Right. Yeah. So obviously, this is you know much improved over the some of the features I was expecting. So that's pretty good incentive for people to check it out. But my next question is, what about privacy? Right. I mean, Google, we know, right? I mean, <laughs> it's like you kind of sell your soul with Google. I, I'm very heavily invested in the ecosystem. I've decided that's the way I want to go. I'm I'm fine with it. I'm very happy overall that Google hasn't seemed to abuse that so far in general. And more importantly, that their systems have been up and running extremely reliably. And for me, it's business, right? I, I do a lot of business with Google and like my own business through Google's application and services. So it has to be mission critical. So tell us about those two things. What are you doing in terms of privacy and in terms of what data you gather? How, how transparent are you about that? Or what, can people choose what you keep? And Because now you have access to people's phone numbers and all kinds of things. 
Um, and also, in terms of reliability, how bulletproof is this service going to be for customers? Let me talk about the privacy first, right? So since the inception, right, TrueCaller has been privacy by design. The, the whole concept of the, the application ecosystem for TrueCaller is that uh, subscriber data or user data, uh, the profile information, is sacrosanct. Uh, nobody could get at that data. And so that data is never exposed um, unless it is between two true caller users who consent. So for example, if, if all three of us were true caller users, we could use the true caller messaging uh, application. We could use the true caller uh, dialer, um, but that we, we do not monetize that data outside of the applications like, like many people in the business do. And, and, and you're right, Miriam, a lot of people trade convenience for privacy when they're using Google or social networks, those type of things. That's not the model, the business model we're in. And I think that um, when you look at now, we, we, we do ask people to participate in scoring spam, for example, right? If, if well, call that's comes great. in and, and we say, let's take Sourcing is valid exactly. for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. It's very yeah. valid, right? And so that helps us yeah. disposition the calls and, and share that with, the, you know, and leverage that to protect people. Our, our, our mission is to protect consumers, make communications more efficient. You know, now people are paying more for their devices, more for their plans. If they install TrueCaller, especially with the assistant, on any device, on any carrier, they're going to get that protection. We're going to make sure the good calls get through, and then they get these advanced services that that Raf and his team have built. And Raf, you've done a good job with the uh, with the privacy there as well. Yeah, yeah. And on on uh, as you mentioned, because a lot of the call screening is happening on the cloud for us and not on device, then what we do is we added measures when we built this. We were very privacy focused. Um, it's it's it's, it's Private phone calls. These are these are uh, um, calls that people want to keep private. And what we're doing is, as soon as um, all the information that that we have in the cloud, um, we built it in a way where um, the information is downloaded to the user's device and then not kept in the cloud anymore. As right. as a as it's built yeah. in, that's how we built the the product because. Um, you know, we're in a world that is much more privacy uh, aware and, and that's how products should be built today. Yeah. I mean, I 100% agree with you, but there's also the practical uh, benefit of you not having to store anything, which costs money, right? <laughs> Especially if you're storing audio data, which, yes. as we know, is uh, something you need exactly. to analyze, right? So, and, yeah. And all the processing is done on the cloud, which means you save phone battery and it's not processed on your phone. So that's an extra plus where um, we actually see that um, it doesn't uh, drain uh, battery from your phone, right. um, which is right. another plus. Yeah. But you do need a connection, right? So if you're uh, in a situation where you only have cellular connectivity, but no data, like, so you can make texts, um, old school SMS texts, and you can only make phone calls. I presume TrueCaller is not going to work locally to a minimal extent. Do you still have some features at work? Maybe a database of blocked numbers or anything like that that is locally stored? Sure. The assistant, you know, what's interesting about TrueCaller is that uh, we are very prevalent, uh, you know, not only in the West, but in emerging markets, right? So you have a variety of different accesses to bandwidth there. And so from yeah. a core TrueCaller perspective, forget about the assistant and, and the complexities we just described there and those advanced features. Absolutely, right? We can, we can, uh, we can use the database, as if you want to call it a database, the, the caller ID. Um, the the spam database, right? And and that can be used even if you don't have a clear data connection. Cool. So going forward, are we going to see some of the new functionality we're seeing on the Pixel caller system? Because they keep launching new things. One of my favorite that I use all the time. And right now I feel like I'm stuck in iMessage world, but on my Pixel, because I will never ever give this feature up, is the hold for me feature. So will, will this is something you're thinking of doing? Because I mean, the sky's the limit now, right? This, and, and, you know, if, if you're a Samsung user right now, or even just a, you know, a, 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 any phone that's not, not a Pixel, basically, that's a lot of Android phones, especially abroad, um, that'd be a major bonus. So what are you working on that you can tell us at least about? You got yeah. quite a roadmap, Raf, so... <laughs> Yeah, we got quite a roadmap. The 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 minute you're taking your calls and and having them go through an AI assistant that understands 
what the caller is saying. The, we we do NLP, so uh, we understand the text the the caller right. is saying and, and, and natural their language processing. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And 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 we're 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 extracting intentions, and we so the sky is the limit, like you said. And um, we can we have so many ideas of where to take this, and uh, and we're constantly in contact with our users, and we're seeing what they need and where they want us to take it, and we're trying to keep in touch with uh, with our audience uh, to build that roadmap. Um, right now, we're focusing on the incoming calls part of it. So uh, all the features that are related to incoming calls, what you mentioned about outgoing calls or hold for me, these might come in the future. Uh, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Also, I have a quick question for you. How many languages do you support right now? Because obviously, since you have a big presence abroad in developing countries and places that are not the West, tell us a little bit about that. We're in 42 countries. Now, that doesn't mean that's that every country has a discrete language, but it gives you a pretty good idea of the breadth of what we do with, with TrueCaller as a service, as localized application. And then, Raf, the, the possibilities you have for uh, language support for the assistant. So um, we launched in English in the U.S., and um, the ability to add languages is just a click away because we're using uh, speech-to-text and text-to-speech models that support practically all languages. Um, so the support of languages is just a question of where do we launch the feature next? Fantastic. So, wow, this is great. I mean, I'm sold. I'm going to try it out for sure. So, you know, any final words, anything else you think our audience should know? I would say that, um, you know, we've become, because of robocalls, robotext, we've become accustomed to not answering our phones. We yeah. want you to answer your phone again. We think if you're going to get a new device over the holidays, you should download True Caller so that, because we're very precise about making sure that we don't over filter all the calls and you right. miss the call from the pharmacy or the doctor or your kid's school or the next job opportunity. So, you know, give us a try. And, and we're focused on, you know, not only keeping the bad guys out, but making sure that the calls that matter get through. Fantastic. Are you going to provide our listeners with a special offer? Yeah, so today, if you want to try the assistant, you get a 14-day free trial uh, to test it out. But uh, we'll definitely get something special for your listeners. Awesome. Clayton, Raphael, thank you so much for being my guests on the show. I really appreciate it for clarifying a whole bunch of stuff and telling us all the awesome things about TrueCaller. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Absolutely. And we're now back with Chris Davies of Slash Gear. Hi, Chris. How are you? Hello. Do you know, I am very good. Thank you, Miriam. How are you? Fantastic. Honestly, it's a little chilly here in San Francisco. Finally, some seasons. Something that you have had for months now, I think. Yes, I am out here in America's beautiful Midwest, and we do have seasons. Fall is here with a vengeance. <laughs> the leaves are everywhere. Um, and we're just trying to make the most of it before winter comes, and I am forced to go and bed down in the basement and hibernate for a while until the spring. I know you will disappear and we will not see you again until, oh, I say MWC. Ye basically, yes. Much like one of those fat bears, um, <laughs> I, I, will, I will just stock up on leftover Halloween candy, which is the easiest way to calorie load. And I will just go into my burrow with um, a collection of uh, Jane Austen novels. Um, and, and that will be me. Um, is that you know. where all the candy went that I tried to get at the supermarket the day after Halloween? I send out all of the DoorDash people and I tell them any, <laughs> any cheap candy, um, just bring it to me. Because if there's one thing America does well, it's high fructose corn syrup. Mmm, mm, tasty. Delicious. Insert, uh, you know, uh, Simpsons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sounds here. Okay. So listen, we've got a bunch of news. Obviously, we just heard from TrueCaller about their app. I think that was pretty cool. Folks, if you skip that part, there is a promo and a special giveaway that I'm going to mention later in the show. So stay tuned for that. But right now we've got, it's been a quiet week, right? Again, second week of, whew. I, I feel like after we had the, the crazed October, like this is our, this is our moment of slight rest. Is it me or does it seem like every year is worse and it's just that we forget how bad it was the year before? 
I think we're we're a little bit like goldfish in that you know we swim from one side of our tiny tank to the other, going, "Oh my goodness, this is shiny," and then and then we're like, "Oh, it's too shiny," and then we swim around a bit more, and it's like, "Goodness, this is shiny." Oh, too shiny. Yes, and then you know, periodically stopping off to see the little man with bubbles coming out of him, and you know, that's that's not a Michael Jackson reference. Um, no, but no. I mean, I think it's fair. This works. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Makes a change. Tech journalists are fish. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, pretty much. I, I think, you know, I, there have been worse comparisons. <laughs> I've, I've been victim to them. So, yeah, absolutely. You heard it here first. <laughs> the first thing on the agenda, I mean, it doesn't have to be, but nothing year stick, I guess is what it's called. What? <sighs> yes. It's, you know, I... <sighs> And I don't want to be pessimistic from the get-go. You know me. I'm a you fount of joy. You don't want to be pessimistic. I know. I'm a happy, ah. uncynical person. That is my, right. That is my basically my shtick. <laughs> I don't quite understand nothing. Like I get, like I understand them in the sense that they are a business making phones and accessories. I kind of can't get past this idea that they are making products that are designed to look really good in press photos but haven't really given much thought to anything beyond that. Like, I feel like that it is just one constant launch campaign and then they actually launch a product and it's like, eh, yeah, 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 but we're launching something new and it's, and everyone's like, oh, something new oh, you say. Yes. yes. Oh. And it is transparent. Show me more. Ooh, quite literally. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. And I think extra doubt about this particular product because it felt like they had some decent headphones, earbuds to begin with. Like the first yeah. set? So I have the first set. And okay. honestly, for the money at the time, they were $99. That's now right. Now they've gone up to yeah. almost 150 because inflation. Of course. That also doesn't look good, you know, especially really if doesn't. you're a startup. Yeah. To crank up the price of your already pretty awesome earbuds and mm -hmm. then release, you know, pretty awesome from the reviews, but probably not as good because we know the no. specs are not as good. Yeah. Earbuds for the same price as the previous ones, but with less features. Anyway, the point is that the originals had a lot of teething problems with the firmware. Right. But once they got that ironed out, which is unfortunately wasn't during the review period, but it was in the, last, uh, the first three or four months. Mm -hmm. It Honestly, they're great. And they look super cool. They sound decent. They mm -hmm. do noise canceling, active noise canceling. They have wireless charging. And for $99, there is very little out there that could touch that. And, uh, you know, the only drawback really from the design perspective is that because there's so much translucent plastic, it scratches up real fast. It's kind of like the back of the iPod, remember? Yes. Uh, yeah. So... That's what but I mean. I like they look them. they look really good in the in the press photos. They look fantastic. Um and I yeah. think that it's you know, there isn't kind of the same consideration given maybe to how they will look in three months' time. Um three weeks. Three, oh you see, you're we are more cynical than I was. I was no, thinking three months. I, I, I yeah, I'm just I'm just being mean now. Yes. Look, I, the stick ones, I like the idea of a case that's a cylinder that kind of opens mm -hmm. by screwing it open or something. That's pretty cool. But $99, so for now, two ma major missing features, well, at least one major and one minor, which are, there's no active noise cancelling, and they're not even, they're like the original, like, AirPods. They don't have silicon tips, mm -hmm. so there's no passive noise cancellation either. They're essentially gonna, you know, sit on the opening of your ears, like the... Yeah. AirPods did the original and your music comes out and uh, all of the sound around you comes in as well. And uh, it's fine. Like the original OnePlus buds were like that and I like them, mm -hmm. but I think we're two years past that. Now you can find active noise canceling earbuds from like real me for 50 bucks. Yeah. I think it's a requirement. I feel like, I mean, I quite like that sort of slightly balancing in your ear, earbud thing. I liked the yeah, first gen generally. AirPods for those because there was, my ears are tricky. And so the earbuds that kind of have to slot in and fix in with the little silicon tips, they can do, after a little while, they feel uncomfortable for me. So I like the ones that just balance. But I think you're right. You know, we are in a stage now where the, the wireless earbuds market is incredibly competitive. It's just, you know, there are so many good options. And if you want a brand name, there are some incredible options there. If you're just looking to spend like 50 to 100 bucks, there are some amazing options, you know, that if you don't mind not having a recognizable name on them. And, and I think that Absolutely. we're kind of getting to the stage where they're almost disposable. Um, yes. And I mean, yeah. Those Realmes I have, um, I think I, they're the second gen. There's a third gen model now, but it's actually not as good. Like mm -hmm. it's 
it's the same specs and the same pricing, but the sound wise, they don't sound as good to me. Right. But the, um, the Realme Buds 2, I think is the ones I have, are for $50, $50 on Amazon US, like no weird imports. You're getting active noise canceling, fantastic sound, no wireless charging, but good battery life. Like it, you could throw them away if, and not feel bad almost. You know what I'm oh, saying? Yes. Yeah. And I think that, you know, once you get to that $100 mark, you kind of, as, and as you said, you know, not just $100, but $100 that used to get you the much better ones. And that's and, the tricky yeah. part because, yeah. you know, when they were 99, the old ones, the year one, mm-hmm. they were great for that price. And yeah. the only com- t- competition they had at the time, because they also had wireless charging, the only pair of earbuds for $99 with ANC and wireless charging from an, a known brand. I'd like to think nothing is a known brand now. Just but about. it was TCL. TCL yeah. Move Audio S600, $99 wireless charging, ANC, great sound. Good battery life. That was the only, and they've they're still ninety nine dollars. So, yeah. of of course you're gonna say they look you know very generic because they're TCL, but you're paying I guess extra for the design now. But you didn't used to, so mm. yeah. And and honestly, I don't know if I want my earbuds to stand out. Like I just right. I, like I don't know if I want someone to look over and be like, oh, what's in his ears? You know, <laughs> I, I'm I am quite happy. I can't see them when I've got them in. So, I mean, I'm quite happy with something generic and just, you know, I was yeah. thinking the other day, actually, how everyone laughed when the AirPods first came out and it was like, oh, you've got half a cotton bud sticking out of your ears or something. Yeah. And, it, and and now it's just like, this. that's just what people have in their ears. It's just this kind of, it's expected that you have a generic little yeah. stubby thing sticking out of your ear. I don't really need it to be transparent. Yes, I agree. But also this has no wireless charging, which I mean, the design of the case makes it almost impossible, which is yep. why I love the idea. I love the cleverness of it, but I'm just like, I don't know. It's a tough sell. It is. Then again, they might sound really great, you know, and, and that could be what saves them from the reviews. It seems to be the case. The ear ones sounded, I would say in the upper percentile of good, mm-hmm. not, not great. They were probably very good. But, you know, this might be the thing. It's like, to me, the original OnePlus Buds are still some of the best sounding non-ear tip earbuds without like any kind of noise canceling. Mm-hmm. I feel like they're way better than AirPods and not the pros, obviously, but that's a different category sure. of product. But like, I feel like for, as you said, for, for some people like you and I personally also like it, if I'm not going to have noise canceling, might as well just have them hang out at the edge of my ear. Yeah, be take them in and out easily, just yeah. not notice that they're, yeah. I think it's, yeah, it is just a really competitive segment and it's kind of, you need to bring your A++ game. You can't just yeah. bring your A game anymore and it is, I'm not sure whether, you have to really like the style, I think, to all. And, and how can you stay in business when you're a startup doing this too? That's the other thing, right? Like the phone, they really nailed it. That phone, I mean, the gimmicks are the gimmicks. Mm-hmm. I could live without them and they're kind of an, a value add in a way to me. But the phone, I felt, was so well balanced in terms of specs, Mm -hmm. and it didn't cut any corners for the price. Like, you know, it had everything I expected, wireless charging, metal and glass. It had a decent processor, a decent camera system with OIS, decent battery life. It wasn't like a flagship, of course not, but it kind of- It wasn't priced that was a flagship either. Exactly, and value was there too. So it was kind of Mm -hmm. basically like- you know, if you compared it to a flagship, it was like 80% of everything of a flagship. Yeah. And that's like the original Nord too, right? The, the OnePlus mm-hmm. Nord. That's kind of like the kind of phones I get excited about. Even at $200 price point, if I can get a phone that's really well balanced, that's kind of what I'm looking for. So they nailed the phone. I thought they nailed the original earbuds, yep. despite the ironing out the firmware issues. And then... Like, why even make another pair of earbuds at this point? So this is this is my... So I'm wondering whether they knew that they were going to have to raise the price of the original ah, earbuds. And so yeah. they needed something which was going to be quick to produce and still hitting that kind of just under $100 price point. I don't know. Again, me being cynical. Yeah, I feel like that's very possible. The other thing I'm thinking is, you know, maybe they didn't sell that well with the first ones. and yeah. there's or made very little profit on them. Mm-hmm. And so they're going to keep them around, but they're kind of going down market because they, they think there might be an opportunity to insert the brand yes. uh, and give the brand more visibility. Yeah. Um, 
although they're not really going down market because this, <laughs> the previous model were 99. It's the same, I mean, yeah. right? It's, they're, I think they're spec wise just, going down market. But. It could just be a perfect storm, I think, of like the, the, the strategy, the launch issues that any startup has, and the fact that, you know, like making things is more expensive these days because, For the, sure. you know, we are still feeling the pinch of everything. Everything. I also would have preferred for them to do something like a wearable of some kind. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I get the feeling looking at the phone one, it has so much of that OnePlus or BBK group DNA to it. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if we did a bit of digging around, if it was manufactured by the same ODM, you know, or factory or, or supplier or whatever you want to call it. Because obviously I'm sure BBK has its own factories for yeah. all their phones. But I'm just saying like, you know, there's definitely some kind of carryover from from the OnePlus BBK group world in the nothing universe from Carl Pay's, you know, transitioning over. Yeah. And and I would have loved to see that happen mm-hmm. with a wearable. Like a OnePlus yeah. watch like wear, wearable or like a fitness band, like a mm-hmm. just like a Fitbit competitor, you know, using some generic Chinese um real time OS would have been fine because all of these, the Xiaomi bands and the Huawei bands and the Honor bands that you can buy for 50 bucks, 100 bucks, are all really good. And they all have really good sleep tracking, good fitness features, good, mm-hmm. you know, general health tracking. And they sync with like Google Fit and they sync with like Apple, you know, health. Mm-hmm. So that would have been yeah. cool. Yeah, low hanging fruit. I mean, you have to imagine that they are working on something like that, and maybe, maybe it was a timing thing too. And it was just, it was that the earbuds were ready now, and other yeah. things will be ready later. Yeah, but it's a bit of a head scratcher, and you know, I'm I've asked them to send me a pair, so I, maybe they'll change my mind when I listen to them. And be like, oh, okay, I get it now. But it's still hard to get past this price weirdness. Yeah. Yeah. And it's especially, I'm I'm staring literally at a pair of ear ones on my desk right now, and I'm like, "You were good enough." Like, yes. <laughs> I mean, you were actually you were pretty a contender. Great. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I I don't know. I am a little puzzled, which is kind of why I wanted to include these. It's uh, maybe a sign of the times. Maybe this is showing kind of. Like, you know, the same loaf of bread a year ago was less expensive. So it's kind of maybe that's what we're seeing here. Maybe, maybe. Maybe, maybe we're going to get a down spec loaf of bread for the same price. You'll open it up and then it'll just be hollow inside. Um, mm. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, a lot of loaves of breads are good that's loaves true. of bread are hollow inside anyway. That's, yes. That's, the that's, bubbles. That's, that's what that's makes a whole it different good podcast. Bread, yeah. I know. That's the bread podcast. Welcome to the bread podcast Welcome. with Chris yes. Davies and Miriam Joir. Today we'll be talking about the finest bread knives that money can buy. And toasting, should you be trying it? Is it a new thing? <laughs> Melted butter. When to say when? The answer, <laughs> oh, of course, Chris, is never, never say when. You and I should just More create <laughs> random, random parody podcasts. <laughs> as long as we don't have to actually produce them, that would be far too much effort. It's just like uh, the first five we'll seconds. We'll just farm that out yeah. to someone. Okay, that's okay. That's fine. Fiverr. Fiverr will help. <laughs> Poor Just slime, ask yeah. to the extra level of jankiness, right? <laughs> All right. So Apple iPhone is getting USB-C. This has been obviously clearly, you know, in the works because of the European Union ruling. Mm-hmm. But we've heard it now from the horse's mouth, you know, at the uh, Wall Street Journal, whatever it's their conference, you know. Yes. Joanna, thank you for extracting that. Did you actually watch the video? She had like a whiteboard. Yeah, and I she think, was like pointing at it. Was yes, fantastic. It was, well, I mean, Joanna is tremendous always. I mean, we all love Joanna. Hundred um, percent. Yes, I think what's interesting is that if you listen to what was said, it was that of course Apple will comply with the EU regulations, and if you then look at the EU regulations, all that says really is that if a device has, if a phone or another kind of small portable electronic device has support for wired charging, it must use USB C. So my curiosity is, at what point does Apple say, okay, well, we are just going to go wireless charging all the things and we're going to get rid of ports altogether, which is kind of what we have been moving towards doing over the past however many years. It will make production easier. You know, we've got rid of SIM cards. We don't yeah. have a headphone jack anymore. We can seal this up more straight from more easily. We can sell it to you as an idea more easily because suddenly this is more waterproof. You know, you don't have to worry about, you know, it's not just like a half hour or an hour of immersion. This is just, you know, dunk this in the toilet. Don't actually dunk it in the toilet. But, you know, 
it, it this is the kind of thing I feel like Apple Depends would make. Your would, well, that's true. Again, different podcast. Um, I feel like this is the kind of thing that Apple could sell really easily as a, a strategy. Yeah. And I, I kind of wonder, are we going to get like a year or two of USB-C iPhones? Or does Apple kind of go, hmm, sod it, let's just go the whole hog and get rid of ports altogether? And I don't know whether they are at that stage yet. And I don't know whether they were thinking about being at that stage and then kind of, you know, the the whole kind of global weirdness and supply chain stuff has kind of made that impossible now. But I feel like everyone's talking about a USB-C iPhone. And in fact, what they said was that they will comply with the EU regulations. And no one wants to read those because I tried and it's like yes, I mean, it's pages. Europe. It's just, it's, well, that too, yes. It's but, bureaucracy. Um, it's, it's carbon <laughs> copy and triplicate. Absolutely. Not yes. like America or, you know, North America where, you know, things are very straightforward in regulations. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, but no, it, I think it's, but I feel like this is overdue. You yes. know, I, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, if you look at um, how long Lightning has been around and kind of not just the convenience factor of it, but the the kind of the things that we've since been kind of missing out on, because I'm an iPhone user and, you know, there, I would love faster data speeds, you know, for transfers yeah. and backups and things that you do if you're doing them wired. You know, that there are things that USB-C does or the Better. USB-C standard does that is really good. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's a bunch of variables at play here. I mean, one of them is, you know, like the as variables that dictate whether or not they're going to go, you know, completely portless mm -hmm. or USB C for a couple of years, kind of thing. Yeah. And I think for me, it's like the variables are charging speeds, right? Yeah. Is is important? Um, you know, whether you have a port or not, and they've it, clearly if they have a port, the law says it has to be USB Type C. Yeah. But part of it is they could go wireless only with MagSafe. Yes. Right. So. Does Apple want to support faster charging or not? Is the first question. Mm -hmm. Are they going to cave into the competition from Android where 30, 30 watt is pretty much the baseline now, right? I mean, yeah. there's a few outliers here. Pixel is at, at the border of that and Samsung's mm -hmm. at the border of that. But if you look at pretty much anything out of China, it's 30 watt or more in the mid range to flagship level. Yes. And up to, you know, we've seen 210 watts recently yes, yeah. from Redmi there. And so, you know, yeah. So the question is, I don't expect them to go that route, but I wouldn't be surprised if at some point they're going to add some sort of faster than 30 watt charging. If you do that, you can do it wireless, but you really need uh, a custom setup like in the same mm -hmm. way as OnePlus and Xiaomi and Oppo and all these companies have custom high speed wireless charging. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are fans in the bases. There's a lot of losses and a lot of heat. And I don't see Apple going quite there, at, especially after the fiasco that was their wireless, uh, what is Air it power. called? Yeah. Yes. Air power, right? So they're like, so part of me is on the side of they're going to keep the port because they want an option for slightly faster charging than MagSafe. But the day that they can crank the MagSafe speed to 30 watt mm -hmm. without a fan in the puck, Yep. And in a reliable way, we're going to see the port go away. So the question is, what How will happen first, right? Yes. How can they reach one or the other first? And my gut tells me Apple is actually relatively conservative mm -hmm. until they can make it a seamless, beautiful experience, which I think MagSafe is. And that's kind of where they're going. They're going to have to, in the immediate, like intermediate step of having a port. And then it's going to have to be USB-C. And if you look, even if the, if the base iPad, like the cynic in me wants to say, MFI, all the things, lightning, all the things, you make money, right? Like I understood when they put USB Type-C on the iPads Pro, that made sense. Mm -hmm. Then maybe the iPad Air, I was like, okay, sure. But then now the base iPad, which you just reviewed, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, that's weird that they didn't put lightning on that because don't they want to make money off the MFI stuff, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, isn't that the best-selling iPad? Pad probably is. I, I yeah, I'm, guess, I'm don't, right? it's, yeah, they I mean, don't because they don't break one, out but, the official yes. Right. Yeah, the previous gen. Yes. So the fact that they went USB type C on that tells me that we're gonna see USB type C on the phones. And then it'll be like hallelujah for at least a year or two until mm -hmm. they go like, hey, watch this. We can now do MagSafe at 30 watt or whatever. And we have built in like, you know, what do you want to call it? some sort of USB over wireless, like kind of like, remember what, what was it back in the day that did that? They had the, the, the magnetic 
strap on oh, accessories. Um, th- there was um, Essential did that. Essential, thank you. Yes. So some whatever it was like wireless USB or something. Mm-hmm. It was like some kind of like high high frequency, you know, it's like an ultra wide band, short range band, thing. Exactly. Yes, so yeah. I'm thinking. So so that's kind of what I see happening. And then because right now, if you're a creator and you're shooting pro raw, you, you you're you're hurting already with lightning. Yeah. USB C is going to help, but yeah. if you remove USB C two years down the road then you're going to hurt again unless you have some kind of solution for high-speed data. And maybe Apple's going to say, well, you know, that's why you have, you know, AirDrop, so get used to it. I mean, I feel like AirDrop has been the answer to a lot of things. Um, you know, as I as I have reviewed phones and iPads and laptops from them over the years, it's kind of always been this thing of, you know, well, yes, we are designing for creators, and as long as you are a creator who is okay using AirDrop, that's fine. Um, <laughs> and when it works, AirDrop is magical as they yeah. would say. And it's just the problem is that, you know, when you suddenly get into the middle of a crowded hall of other people using wireless devices, and then suddenly you can see everyone else's phone on your screen and oh. your iPhone is is not showing up. And you're like, what? Wh- wh- where are the things? Where are my things? Yeah. Where are my things? I think that's the problem because also because it's Wi-Fi based. Yeah. You know, I mean, Wi-Fi 7 is going to solve a lot of this, but it doesn't look like they just made Wi-Fi 6C e happen on the air, the iPad Pros yes. with M2 chips. So that's like, whoa, they're a little behind there. A little. I mean, look, I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see USB-C, at least with this next phone, maybe the one after that. And mm-hmm. then then all bets are off after that. Yeah, yeah. Because no, I, think you, I think you are probably right, yes. I actually feel like Apple has an opportunity to continue the MFI madness with MagSafe, mm-hmm. right? But MagSafe has a lot of potential because Max, what makes MagSafe so clever, it's not just cheap compatible wireless charging, you know, it is got this awesome magnetic alignment thing going on, mm-hmm. which is such a simple thing that I'm surprised yes. Android hasn't replicated in some way. I think there's a phone from Vivo or ZTE, ZT, I think that does that, that has that. Okay. And it's, I think, compatible with MagSafe, even though they don't say that because Apple, you know. It would, yes. But the point is, if they can crank up the speed of charging through MagSafe so that it's still Qi compatible but can go up to 30 watt in a proprietary way or maybe with a next generation Qi standard, which have been discussed for a while now, mm-hmm. um, then we have an opportunity for them to possibly even charge MacBooks with MagSafe. Not the MagSafe we have now. Right. Not the in this third incredibly gen confusing... new MagSafe from yes. the, you know what I'm saying? I do, yes. I'm talking about a magnetic wireless MagSafe. Imagine the back of your laptop has at the two corners or the four corners of it a MagSafe magnet thing yeah. and you just slap it on there and you charge your your laptop. It's magic. It is. And that expensive, would be cool. probably. It would be cool. Because especially if you can reach like 30 watt or even more than that, 60 watt or something, then they can do it. And then, you know, the next holy grail is make the puck work with the Apple Watch and the AirPods case so that because it's a smaller coil, you yeah. need a, a kind of a sub coil inside the bigger coil. Mm-hmm. And then you have a universal solution that, you know, they can just label under MagSafe. And I think that's, that would excite me because, you know, then they can be all proprietary all they want, but it's still backwards compatible with Qi. Yeah. And they can make money off the accessory makers like they are mm-hmm. with MFI today. As and, they love. you know, we don't have to worry, worry about having a port anymore because the there's a data stream there and there is like a high mm-hmm. speed charging stream. So I don't know. This, this is, this is interesting. It's interesting. It is. And I feel like whatever they were planning two years ago probably has now had to be, had to have been like thrown out and rethought again, just because they are, you know, subject to the same things that everyone else is. So I, I yeah, it is fascinating um, trying to figure out what people were trying to do and what they are forced to do now. Um, it is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, as much as I hate regulation sometimes, I think this is a good one because I live in a USB-C world. I have an Android phone and a Mac mm-hmm. and, you know, ha- headphones and earbuds and other things that are all USB type C and it's wonderful. Yeah. It's like, I literally have a bunch of 30 and 65 watt chargers all over my house plugged in and I just randomly plug stuff into them and I don't even think about it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's amazing. It is. It is. Um, you know, and, and I think it's it has been interesting watching Apple kind of try and argue against that um, for a while. And I think especially that they will con- when 
two thirds of their products are USB Type C. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that you know, as with so many things, they will argue against it until they are ready to um, to argue for it, and we are almost at that stage, I think. Uh, and they're going to find a, a very reasonable argument that it's going to convince us all, like, oh, absolutely, we are, you know, we're being brave or whatever it was. Abs- yes, was tremendously cool. brave. <laughs> Speaking of Apple weirdness, I yeah. know you just reviewed the iPad. We talked about it last week on the show, but that dongle, that $9 <laughs> dongle, I think we've reached peak dongle in Apple land. Like I thought we'd reached peak dongle before with what? I can't remember, with something. Mm-hmm. But this one, that is a female lightning to female USB-C. I, yeah. I kind of want to see what it can do if it carries more than power, if it carries data in some way, I don't believe it does. Um, it is a, it is a tremendously odd thing, and I mean, so my problem with it, I mean, I I get the argument that they're making that there are people who will already have an Apple Pencil who want to upgrade to the newer iPad, and they don't want to spend another ninety nine dollars on an Apple Pencil, you know, and so a nine dollar adapter. Kind of makes sense. I get that, you know, and if you know, because if you're talking about someone at that kind of like three hundred and something dollar price range, sure, yeah. buying another hundred dollar pencil on top of that is a lot of money, you know, pr- sort of proportionally. The thing that gets me is the the female USB C port on it. I know, and the fact that you have to then also carry your charge around because I was reviewing it, I took it around with me, I and I was suddenly thinking if I had to top this up. If I had to plug in the pencil and charge it up again, I would need to have also have brought a cable with me. And I mean, one of the nice things about the old right. way of doing it was that you didn't. You just plugged it into the iPad and that had plenty of juice compared to the pencil. So it is just, it is that kind of weird, you are now kind of more tethered than you used to be. I don't so much <laughs> mind the dongle. It was just the, the what you had to do with the dongle that counts. Right. And, you know, and I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's the story of many people's lives. It's, it's what you have to do with the dongle that is the challenge. Oh man, I I Again, want to order wrong one. Podcast. Yeah, I know different podcasts. Yeah. I want to order one because I want to do things like plug a, an old USB A to Lightning cable yeah. into the USB <laughs> uh, the the Lightning side and see if the USB C will be have juice coming out of it. That's a to uh, charge something. Yeah, I, or the I, other way around, like uh, plug a C to C cable and see if I can. Wait, what else charges over lightning like in a with a male lightning connector? The only thing is the pencil. That's yeah, that's that's the challenge. That the only thing yeah, there isn't anything else that does that. So there's that and there's the fact that it's another thing to carry. Like so and and there's no sort of to like, lose you mean. To well, to lose, yes, but I mean if you assume that you are probably going to have to carry it around, why not make it so that it kind of clips to a charger? Or why not make it so that it like slots onto some? It just that doesn't seem. It was almost like someone said, "Oh God, just a second, we've we've switched <laughs> to USB C, and they need to charge the damn pencil." And everyone's like, "Oh." But okay. I'm surprised they didn't Dongle make time. this yeah. first because weren't the original iPad Pros Lightning? Uh, they but then, they used the pencil too, which charges wirelessly. Oh, even the original iPad Pros did. I thought the, the original iPad Pros used the original pencil. I. Don't, I'm just saying think, there was a transition yeah. from pencil one to pencil two. There was, and I can't now offhand remember it. I don't feel like there was ever a need for a dongle before. And I mean, that's not something I say often. I'm pro team dongle, clearly. Have you ever, has anybody ever tried plugging the pencil into a Apple, Apple mouse? mouse to see yeah, if I'm it'll pr- I'm pretty charge? sure it, 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 someone must have. Yeah, some pervert. I bet you it'll charge, I bet you it'll charge the pencil. Do you think? Yeah, because the mouse has more capacity. But does it support power output? Probably not. That's no, that's probably I a think, firmware thing. I think they would just they would just be just like they would, they wouldn't care. They just be like. I want them know. to balance out so that yes, like, sure. <laughs> that's when you get just sparks like, you know, of electricity between the two. Yeah, just you're back in high school. You're learning yeah. fluid dynamics. Watch the two <laughs> containers equal out. Yeah. Oh man, it's called Apple Equilibrium. Um, yes. We're very excited for you, and we think you're going to love it. <laughs> Q in Johnny Ive. I miss yeah. the Johnny Ive narrated tech video. I know. And I offered my services, but you know, they just don't return my calls. Oh, Apple. I know. They're just not nice. It's true. It's true. Uh, so let's move to the next topic. It's interesting because 
you know, we've seen leaks for the Galaxy S23 Ultra, and I don't generally cover leaks because, you know, I mean, it looks just like a 22 Ultra. Duh. Mm. And uh, it's probably going to have a Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 or whatever the new chip's going to be called. And it's going to have, you know, you know, whatever. It's mm. just going to be slightly improved, like in the same way as the S21, you know, Ultra was just basically... Uh, an improvement of the 20 ultra mm-hmm. and then the 22 is an improvement of the 21. They're not, yeah. they haven't really radicalized too no. much of their, I mean, I do have to say that with the S 22 ultra, we have, we have now have a note as well, which is, you know, right. Yeah. But I think that the leaks so far show that it's going to be the same kind of design. So roughly, yeah. we also have heard there's going to have a 200 megapixel camera, mm-hmm. which it makes sense because there's a few phones out there now with that Samsung sensor. And so, What's interesting is that some apparently somebody leaked some photos and they do look a little cleaner. So whether all of this is true because, you know, it's a leak, but um, I'm kind of excited about that because telephoto seems to be the next, you know, the next thing right now. Mm-hmm. The Pixel 7 Pro is an improvement of the Pixel 6 Pro. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've seen others like the Mate 50 Pro recently from Huawei kind of, you know, be the best, at least on rankings at DxO Mark. And stuff like that. So everybody's trying to, you know, kind of push their uh, telephoto to the max, as it were. Yeah. And so I'm glad to see that we might get a phone that looks almost identical to the S22 Ultra, that has the latest chip, duh, but mm-hmm. has maybe some more more incremental camera changes than we expected. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I'm kind of, again, sounding very cynical, I am sort of in that sort of doldrums period with phones where everything is kind of feeling very Mm samey. And I mean, I I feel like having a 200 megapixel sensor is great, but it's then how you how you use that and how, right. you know, because it, okay. So a lot of people, they taking photos and they're sharing them on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or whatever. And unless you are kind of really, really getting in there and looking at the pixels and, and in a way that doesn't kind of like run you into the compression that social media uses, yeah. you know, how much of a difference do these things make, you know, and then, and then nuts before we start counting filters. And I realize this is an argument that has been said for the past 10 years, you know, because, <laughs> um, tremendously old um but i don't know i want I, I i kind of don't so much care about resolution improvements i care about usability improvements right um and and so that's kind of like i'm very curious to see how they take this 200 megapixel sensor and give me a better more consistent low light experience that doesn't involve me holding still for as long maybe or you know gives me more zoom options that don't make me feel like i'm missing out on having a dedicated telephoto lens Right. So my experience so far with two different phones that have 200 megapixel cameras, I've been playing with the Xiaomi 12T Pro Mm -hmm. and with the Infinix Zero Ultra, which is, uh, you know, phone sold in developing countries. They both have the the better, bigger sensor from Samsung, the same Mm -hmm. one. They both have OIS. And what I'm seeing is it's... It's kind of like when the S20 Ultra came out with that 108 megapixel sensor. It's like they haven't tuned that pipeline quite yet. It's not as good as what we have on an S22 Ultra with 108 megapixel or a a pixel phone from Google with a 50 megapixel main Mm -hmm. sensor or even the iPhone 14 with its 48 megapixel sensor, the Pro. Um, But there's a lot of potential in terms of zoom like obviously you're not going to be using optical zoom, but you now have the potential to kind of do what the iPhone and the pixel do where, you know, the two X is kind of real, real zoom because it's kind of using a a subset of pixels. Mm -hmm. So now imagine you can do this multiple times because you're now, you know, when you're shooting at 200 megapixel, you're getting one-on-one pixels. But if you're shooting the default mode is 12 megapixel output or something. Yeah. So, you know, you're basically pixel binning like some crazy number of like pixels. It's like a four by four array or something. Yeah. And so now you have an intermediate step. They all have a 50 megapixel shooting mode, which is interesting. Mm. In addition to the 200. Yeah. And then they have the 12 megapixel default. So, and then when you zoom in at 2X, at least on the 12T Pro from Xiaomi, with that one, 
the two X zoom is is really great because yeah. I think again they're kind of taking a window, and you can still pixel bin within that to get mm -hmm. low light performance. Yeah, right. I think that that's I think that's really important. I think the other thing that kind of frustrates me at the moment with even the kind of the very latest phones is just the stuff that I as trying to be like an everyday user, it just doesn't seem quite there yet. Like portrait mode with cat, with pet fur and whiskers and things. I yeah. take a lot of pictures of my cat because she is the most beautiful creature She's in the amazing. world. She's yeah. amazing. She is. She is just glorious. And yet, if you try and use, you know, any of the portrait modes, even on the latest ones, you know, some of them are better than others, but there is still that kind of blurry whisker issue. Um, and it just, I feel like, I don't know if this is, I don't know if throwing a bigger sensor at it is necessarily the, the, the kind of the answer here, or if it's to do with, as a lot of the chip makers would love to tell us, it's all about kind of things like onboard AI processing and having sure. standalone kind of neural net chips so that they can do better kind of distinguishing between the different layers. And I feel like, like you said, it's about the pipeline and, you know, the sensor is now almost like a minority part of, yeah. of the end result because it is what is going on between that sensor and the picture in your camera roll. This bit in the middle is just so, still almost kind of so fledgling that, you know, even though we, yeah. even though we have kind of done, seen so much and they've done so much with it, <laughs> you know, the, the results are still not necessarily always great. <laughs> no, hundred percent. I think it's going to take, I think the S23 Ultra will be the best of the 200 megapixels. Mm -hmm. I, there's a Moto one as well, which I haven't played with, so I can't judge, but it's Moto, and Moto is not well known for its imaging pipeline, so sure. I don't have high hopes. But I feel like, you know, we're going to get a decent level of performance from Samsung, but I think if they use that same sensor on the S24 the year after, mm -hmm. it's going to be when it really is, you know, finally at the level we expect yeah. it to be, right? <laughs> And I guess part of the challenge is that, you know, we, when people buy phones, they, they play spec sheet bingo, you know, they, yeah. they look at it and it's like, oh, well, this is a 200 megapixel sensor. And this, so this is better than a 50 megapixel sensor. So yeah. I will have this phone. And what, you know, because it is really hard to tell people, well, actually, you know, this is about the, 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 the photo pipeline and there's the AI things doing it and we're doing object segmentation, you know, and there's background. Yeah, yeah. And, shit. and that's really hard to sell, especially <laughs> if you are like in a Verizon store and, you know, you have like three bullet points on a, on a, a shelf and someone is saying, well, I want Boeing to Samsung because it's got a ton of megapixels. That's how Americans speak. I've got one of those Samsung. Oh, You'll never take me alive, oh, Papa. That's um, right. Yeah, um, I've got a gun. I've got a gun. Yeah, and and diabetes. Um, so I feel like I feel like it is a very hard thing to sell. Like yeah. you know that we have stuck with the same sensor because we know that, and then and that has given us like twelve months to better tune what we are getting from it, rather than being like, oh, actually, well, we have a new sensor. And so we've kind of like started not from scratch, but kind of we are, you know, we're kind of going back to basics slightly and kind of, having to, it's, so I guess, I guess part of the challenge is that people want big numbers. People love big numbers. They just like things that are big. They do. They do. This is America yeah. and we love large, large just things. Big. Just get, yeah. It doesn't matter what it is, <laughs> a burger, a car, um, a deficit, anything, just, anything. you know, anything, just make it the largest. I want and, the biggest furries ever. Yes. Because that's freedom. Correct. Yes. I want to add to that though, that I think <laughs> there is a benefit physically, like from a sensor size, as you said, perspective. And I'm seeing that in these phones is that, you know, when we went to the 48 and 50, especially the larger 48s and the, the bigger 50 megapixel sensors we have mm -hmm. now that have large pixel sizes, and now the 108 and now the 200, is we're getting a much shallower depth of field, which it has its problems, but also has its benefits. The benefits are you don't have to use portrait mode half the time. That's true. Anymore. No. And that's really great. It is. The problem, though, is that you need some really good optics because at the very edge of the of the lens, things get screwy. You get a lot of like, uh, you know, chromatic aberrations and rainbowy weirdness and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a trade-off because the sensor is expensive. The lens is pretty, a little bit more expensive if you want to avoid these aberrations. And so um, some of it is corrected actually in software and the pipeline. So then you also rely on AI and the pipeline to do that to some yep. extent. So it's a different problem. You don't have to, you don't have to separate the whisker from the background, but you have to worry about dealing with those edge distortions. Yes. So I think, I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm kind of welcoming it because ultimately, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, whatever our mobile devices are that can capture videos and photos, 
are going to basically look like, you know, like the eye of an insect, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just going to be a, a like an array of these fixed focus sensors that are just going to basically like you know in light field photography like Lightro did right. Yeah, it's going to be that. It's it, you know, and there's not going to be any moving parts. There's going to be no IS, no autofocus. It's all going to be done digitally mm-hmm. in AI, in in the pipeline, in software and computational photography, and. And so in a way, by putting this large, we're getting there in a way by putting this large 200 megapixel sensor, we, we have that, the eye of the fly kind of thing going mm-hmm. on in a way. And we still have to, it's going to teach us, you know, to kind of figure it out in a way, mm-hmm. because now we can do some cool stuff. Like we can zoom in 2X and still have pixel binning. And mm-hmm. then we can zoom in 4X or whatever without pixel binning at the raw pixel level. And if it's enough light, you you basically get the equivalent of a 4X optical zoom, which is really kind of interesting. It is. So I'm excited. I'm not sold. I wouldn't recommend you buy the phones I'm testing right now mm-hmm. with those 200 megapixel cameras because then you put them side by side to like a Pixel or her, an iPhone or a Galaxy S22 Ultra with, with a 108 megapixel sensor. They just don't quite deliver the same right. polish. And I think that's just a pipeline thing, right? Yeah. No, I think Especially you're right. on Xiaomi's side, because they're, you know, they've got the crazy 12S Ultra Leica phone, right? Mm-hmm. That is really, really, really good from yes. by all accounts. So, and last year's Mi 11 Ultra, which I have, is kind of blew my mind in terms of what he can do. So mm-hmm. I think Xiaomi's going to get there. Yeah. And speaking of which, they mm-hmm. actually modified one of those 12S Pros to take on Leica lenses, interchangeable Leica lenses. Yeah. And they, they kind of made that a concept phone this week. And I'm just That's like, right. what? And it's interesting because it's not just one sensor. It's like it has two sensors. It has one that's used with the, the lens, the interchangeable lens that you would have on a regular right. Leica camera. And, and then it has a sensor that it can use on its own without the lens. And so it's kind of like, yeah, this sort of Frankenstein's monster phone and the pictures, you know, if you look at the pictures, it is hilarious. It is like um, it's it's a lens that has like um, like a slab attached to it. It's it's it is very funny. And it, yeah, I mean, this is not the kind of the first time that we have seen ideas like this. You know, I think there has been kind of like tickles along of this concept of using like pro grade glass with a smartphone. Yeah. It, it it seems like the target audience for this has to be kind of just vanishingly small. As we were saying before we started the recording the podcast, I think even the crazy Sony Xperia fan people mm-hmm. will will be like, nah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And they're the they're the first candidates for this. Oh, absolutely. Because I feel like if you are the great thing about smartphone cameras is that they are incredibly convenient. And you know, a smartphone fits into your pocket and you know it's very small. You can do great things with it. It has a connection built in. And then you have like a proper camera where you know you have all the benefits that a proper camera brings and the drawbacks of you know it being bigger and bulkier. And so it's like, am I going to carry how much more of an effort is it to carry the body of a decent camera if I'm also carrying the lens? Do I really you know yeah. do I, am I really going to do I begrudge the space that much? You know, it, it, is my bag just too small? I don't know. It, it just seems, it seems very much like a case of your scientists spent so much time thinking about whether they could, they didn't think about whether they should. And uh-huh. admittedly, now we have no dinosaur-related deaths, which the I'm next so thing glad you, about. But we're going to have some T-Rex content on this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> again, d- different podcast. Um, <laughs> I just, I mean, I love them for doing it. Like I, I love, love it I love I love stupid geeky stuff like that because it's like this is fun this is interesting this is like it takes you back to the days where you know people were doing just just crazy weird shit but this I mean in terms of like a market potential for it it is very hard to imagine anyone anyone doing this like uh, buying this for real I want it so bad yet <laughs> I also know that it'll be you know a market's again a market share that even the Sony Xperia fans are going to scratch their heads and go, why? And, yeah. and that's quite like a narrow band already. <laughs> yeah, fans. you're already... Like, don't get me wrong, uh, Xperia fans out there, I'm not trying to be very oh, no. I believe that what you like is awesome. Yes. I do love the Xperia phones. I wish they had more computational prowess mm-hmm. on their photography pipeline, but I do like what they're doing. I like the idea of yes. basically the alpha experience in your pocket yep. as an alpha user myself. And, and you know, that's not a, it's not a bad thing. It's just no. that you're narrowing down the niche to 
razor thin here, right? Yes, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, who knows? Maybe they will find six incredibly wealthy people. Not Elon Musk, because he's just spent all his money on Twitter, but, you know, six other yeah. incredibly expensive I mean, expensive he's going to bring people. back Vine. Maybe he'll want this for Vine. Absolutely. You know, if, if there's one thing that was the downfall of Vine, it was that we didn't have pro-grade lens quality for I our mean, six seconds. haven't you heard videos? Yeah. the young people today are going back to using the Fuji X100? That's, they, I mean, I... I don't, I don't understand young people, and I don't intend to start now. We're too old for that, Chris. We really We're just are. too old. I know. Now get off our lawn, okay? <laughs> yeah, look, I think it's interesting. I, the nerd in me is going nuts on this thing. Like, Absolutely. of course I want this, but then I think about yeah. it and I'm like, no, no, no. The yeah. closest we've come, though, is in some ways the Galaxy camera. In some ways, the Sony, remember that Sony thing that clipped onto the back of the phone? It was, and yeah, just was like a lens. And then an RX100? Yes. Without the, the case around it? Yeah, that was, um, I kind of, I, I think about it like, when I get excited about stuff like this, I then remember Google's Project Ara, the, the modular oh, phone. yeah. And how it seemed ostensibly like such a good idea. And it was like, this is, you know, of course it makes sense, you know, that you could upgrade these parts individually. And then you sort of stopped and thought about it. It's like, oh, actually, no, this is, this is kind of a terrible idea. And this won't work at all. And Google eventually realized that too, and then got rid of the project. But, but from a geeky perspective, which I, you know, neither of us are going to be offended if anyone calls us a geek, you know, we love no, this stuff. No, this is We're not going to spend our own American dollars on I mean, it. We don't spend any money on tech anyway. I mean, okay, we, we would not recommend anyone out there spend their own American dollars or whatever <laughs> local currency um, is, because whilst this is a really fun idea, it is also a terrible one. Yes, it's both awesome and horrible. Absolutely, which I mean, I, and I love that. I love that. You know, more of this, please. Give us, you know, multinational, incredibly rich companies, you know, do crazy stuff for us so that we can be like, yeah, this is cool. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Look, we have to wrap up, unfortunately. Um, there's more stuff to talk about, but I, I should have you on sometime and do, do an, like a car EV special, which is just I would love that. Cars. Just, yes. Let's just do that sometime. Do you want to tell folks where they can find you on the internet, your social media handles and all the places you can be found? So you can find me at slashgear.com um, and you can also find me on Twitter talking about nonsense, at least until Elon Musk <laughs> shuts it down. And that's C underscore Davies with an E. Um, and other than that, I, you know, you might find me hanging around behind your bins with the raccoons. You will find me on Twitter at Tankerl, that's T-N-K-G-R-L. And I'm still verified, but probably not for long. And the same handle on Instagram, at Tankerl, T-N-K-G-R-L. Think comic book character, drop the vowels from Tankerl, and you get my handle. So if you want to see pretty pictures of phones and cars and food and travel, Taken with phones, go to my Instagram. If you want to chat with me and Chris about the podcast, go on Twitter, at least while you can. And uh, yeah, there's a couple of YouTube channels you should be aware of, youtube.com slash mobile tech podcast and youtube.com slash mobile tech more, which are basically supplement visual content for this podcast, like unboxing videos and stuff like that. And the first channel is mostly like phones and personal audio and wearables and like the, the core ecosystem. And then the other channel is more like home automation, travel tech, car tech, the other stuff, basically. So you know how YouTube works. Like, subscribe, tell your friends, click the little notification bell, comment, all that good stuff. The podcast lives at mobiletechpodcast.com or on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Cast, Spotify, everywhere good podcasts can be found. So please uh, subscribe and tell your friends. And if you can, if your app lets you, please rate or review the show. That'd be great. I now have a Patreon for the last oh, year and a half or so. And so uh, if you want extra content and you want to help me with the show in terms of financially making the show happen every week, Patreon is a good option. There is a bunch of different perks you get from being a patron. Uh, it can be as little as like a dollar a month, but you can uh, get a video version of the podcast for one of the tiers where you can basically see us uh, in person, which is much nicer. And, you know, you get that a couple of days ahead, which is nice. So you get the podcast before the public audio version on video on Patreon. And, you know, that's a privilege you can have. The other one is, is a Discord server you can join to chat with me and stuff. So there's a bunch of options there. Check it out. If you don't like Patreon, I get it. There's other options you can help financially by clicking in a link in the show notes for a PayPal donation. 
I love my coffee, so buy me a coffee for $5 or something. That'd be great. So these are your options. I hope you can help support the show. We can certainly use your support. And I want to thank our sponsor again, True Caller. True Caller is one of the world's leading caller ID and spam blocking services with more than 320 million users. The app is on Android and iOS and lets you stay protected from robocallers and scammers. So we also have, folks, a giveaway. We're giving away 20 premium subscriptions for six months. They're valued $30 each. The first 20 people to email me at my email address, tankgirl at gmail.com. That's T-N-K-G-R-L at gmail.com, just like the comic book character, drop the vowels. I'm going to get that free six months for $30 premium subscription to Truecaller. So email me. First 20, get it. And uh, I want to thank Truecaller again for being the sponsor this week. And I want to thank you, Chris, for being my guest. It's been fun. Thank you. It is always fun to be on and always fun to talk to you about this stuff. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'll have you on at some point again, especially for that EV special. And folks, we'll have another show next week. So stay tuned for that. Until then, cheers, everybody. This has been the Mobile Tech Podcast with Tank Girl, proudly presented by worldpodcasts.com. You can visit us online at mobiletechpodcast.com.